Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, Jeremy. Yeah. I'm very excited to learn more about your founder journey and what you're building at Anomalo. Yeah, great. Um, great. Yeah, maybe a good starting point. It, it'd be interesting to hear what really seeded your interest in data and machine learning and business building interests that you've applied across your career and everything from insurance and accounting through to ad tech and even last mile delivery logistics. Yeah, I, I found uh, really my first kind of love was math. And you know, I went deep into uh, math research. And at one point, I remember I was you know, 19 or 20 and I was applying to a program at Cornell and I was writing an essay about what I wanted to do with my life. And I spent, you know, a couple of days thinking really hard about it. And what I ended up writing was that I wanted to use math to study human behavior. And at the time I didn't really know, I just, I knew that that seemed like it ought to be possible, but I had no real idea as to how that was going to be done. It just seemed intuitively possible to me. Um, and then, you know, over time, I've, I've always kind of kept that desire uh, to, to, to more deeply understand, you know, how, uh, how humans interact in complex systems. And it turned out that data is the perfect way to study that. Um, and I would always end up approaching data from a couple of different angles. One would be, can I visualize this data? Can I build a better mental model myself, an understanding of what's happening in some system that's generating a bunch of this information related to human behavior. And then ultimately you realize when you do a lot of that, you reach a wall where you simply can't wrap your head around what's really happening. And you actually need to use algorithms to go beyond that. And I began learning about machine learning at the time, you know, predictive modeling, neural networks, all of these kind of early, you know, early technologies for uh, making models to predict behavior in data. And that really set me down the path of machine learning. Then the kind of career implications of that were, well, where, where could, I, could I best actually use this? I, I didn't want to stay an academic. I wanted to have a real world impact, wanted to begin a career, wanted to um, build and grow things. And so I, I began in insurance, uh, which is a natural place to start if you've got a deep understanding of data and want to predict people's behavior. And uh, I spent time there. I spent time doing strategy. Uh, using data to try to help make better business decisions, and then went into technology. And you know that was when I began in advertising technology, and then ultimately uh, into uh, personalization, and then logistics routing at Instacart. Excellent. And um, fascinating to hear that evolution, and what ultimately led you to some leading data science and engineering teams at some very hyper-growth hyper companies like Sailthrough and Instacart, as you mentioned. Um, can you tell us more about your work at, at Instacart in particular um, and what ultimately sort of led you uh, to meeting your co-founder there and, and founding Anomalo? Yeah, so I joined Instacart when it was around 200 people and, you know, it was, it had been growing very rapidly, but it was losing a lot of money for every delivery. So every delivery that Instacart did cost the company you know, $15, $12, you know, so it was, a uh, it was burning, burning money in executing these deliveries. And it was a, it was a fascinating time and opportunity to join because Instacart, there are a lot of things culturally that were very special about Instacart, but one of them was uh, a, the importance that data played in making decisions throughout Instacart and all the way up to the CEO and to how data literate everyone was. And so I could see the foundation for the physics of the business to make money on a per delivery basis. It just hadn't been optimized yet. And there was all of the data being captured that would give you the insights and opportunities for optimization to be able to achieve that efficiency gain. So really that first year or two was all about driving efficiency improvements. And we were rolling out algorithms for optimally sh uh, staffing shoppers, for routing shoppers in the, in the grocery delivery process, for understanding inventory at the store locations in a more predictive way, and you know, figuring out how to make it a unit economic profitable business. Elliot, my co-founder, joined as the head of product 
and then the head of growth about halfway through that journey. And so we worked at the at the end of that, you know, drive to profitability together. And then once we'd achieved that unit economic profitability, we turned back towards growth and continuing to accelerate that. And so Elliot and I worked really closely on, you know, how do we really improve the advertising side of the business? How do we drive growth in more scalable ways using data? Um, and so, you know, Elliot and I bonded over our shared love of data, of using it to make better decisions, of leveraging, you know, new modern algorithms and approaches to optimize businesses for, for, for growth. And we sat together on the, on the executive team at Instacart, helping to make, you know, the strategic decisions that that company needed to make as it scaled through things like the Whole Foods acquisition by Amazon, which was a really interesting time. And I just had a tremendous amount of respect for Elliot. And we, we always saw eye to eye on both technology and philosophy and strategy, right? The kind of the, all of the kind of core, core important things in running a business. And so I left after about three years. I wanted to, I felt like I had uh, been the head of data science. You had, a few, as you said, a couple of these rapidly scaling companies, and I knew I wanted to do something different. I didn't really know what it was that I was going to do differently, and I took some time off. But then when Elliot left not long after I did, and we got together and he said, Jeremy, I'd love to start a company. I'd love, I'd love to do it with you. I was like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. You're the person I want to work with. And so uh, really it was about Elliot and I wanting to work together. And we knew from that first coffee meeting in San Francisco that data was going to be a central part of what we were going to do. Um, it was both of our passions and, and you know, my deep kind of technical expertise. And so we got together and put all of our ideas on a whiteboard of what we might want to build. And data quality was uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that was just obvious there needed to be a better solution in the market and that we had the skill set to tackle it and that we could get to something that customers would find valuable quickly. Uh, and so we started building that, you know, after our second meeting. Excellent. And can you tell us more about the data quality problem space that you ultimately landed on and are now solving for? Yeah. If you, from Elliot and I's perspective, we had seen Instacart be this transformative business that was successful in large part because of its ability to embrace, capture, leverage data. And yet it was still really difficult. It's really painful. We would look at some of the very best analysts at Instacart and how they spent their time. And it was not uncommon for them to spend half of their time fighting data quality issues. And every time any insight that was meaningful about the business was raised, there was always doubt and speculation as to whether or not the, the data itself could be trusted underneath, underneath that insight. And what we, what we realized is that there were a couple of trends that had come together at Instacart and were coming together at many companies. One was the movement to the cloud into these cloud data warehouses, Snowflake, BigQuery, Databricks, that make it so easy and all the associated tools that make it so easy to stand up, you know, the collection of every scrap of data that could possibly pass through an organization and make it available in a single queryable environment. And then, you know, the increasing literacy and use of data by everyone throughout the organization from, you know, product to operations, to finance, to marketing, to engineering, to obviously the data the, and the machine learning uh, you know, capabilities. And so you had these two trends that were happening. And yet the historical approaches to ensuring that the data quality itself could be trusted they were never designed to scale to an environment like that. They were designed for an environment where you, you were really managing a small kind of walled garden set of data that was about key financial processes that changed very slowly and was used for reporting financial statements, right? Or making a few operational decisions. To so now one where every scrap of data was available and accessible and everyone was using it for a wide variety of different use cases. And so the, the historical approaches of let's just write rules for every scrap of data that tightly constrain it, like you might unit tests for code, wasn't going to scale. You couldn't write all of the unit tests for the thousands of tables that were in Snowflake or BigQuery, you know, for the hundreds of columns, for the hundreds of segments, and then maintain all those rules as all that data was constantly shifting because of third-party vendor changes or you know, changes being made in the application code. 
And what we wanted to do was create software with intelligence integrated into it that could do that monitoring in a faster, easier way and let people know about the data quality issues before their internal or external customers found out about them. So before we get an influx of a bunch of complaints from you know, Instacart customers that there's no meat at Costco, which is one of our favorite examples, like you could for a while search and just, no, yeah, Costco doesn't carry meat anymore. Well, that's not true. That's a data quality issue that it took us you know, getting a bunch of complaints from customers to observe. Let's have an automated system that can look for changes like that in the data in an intelligent way and notify people about it as soon as it happens. So you can get ahead of the issue, save a bunch of time and, and continue to have trust in the data. Tell us more about how the, the software works, really. What is your approach? What's your secret sauce for overhauling these historical approaches that, that don't work with the way we use data now? Yeah, there's a couple of pieces. So the first one that we build are machine learning algorithms that can sample data from arbitrary tables with arbitrary structure and detect meaningful changes in the distribution of data arriving into the table without having to have a, any configuration. You just point the algorithm at a table and it can observe data flowing into that table. It can learn whether or not there are specific you know, seasonality patterns, types of chaos that typically happen in that data and identify if all of a sudden a segment of data like meat disappears or a distribution changes in a column, like all of the FICO credit scores for your loan application process have suddenly started skewing 30 points higher than they had in the past. Or even if the relationship between two columns change, you know, the amount of tax that you're charging per transaction is all of a sudden you know, significantly different in its relationship to the total transaction value that it was before. Uh, so this is some real uh, novel approaches and innovation that we built early on at Anomalo to tackle that problem. And we think about that as a base layer of protection that you can run against all of the data that you care about. The other piece that we build is the user interface to do all of the visualizations and reporting on data quality issues to data savvy users. They could be data scientists or analysts and the tools to allow them to go in and still create rules, hard and fast constraints about the data and to create metrics and be able to monitor metrics for unusual changes. And so you know, when, when you have subject matter expertise in the organization and it's distributed in the organization, we have a platform that makes it very easy for them to come in, see the underlying changes that are happening using the machine learning and then add their own expertise and their own constraints and you know, information they'd like to track closely on top of it. And then all of the notifications and workflow components that you need to be able to scale a system like that in the enterprise. Very interesting to hear about. And I can't help but notice, it sounds like the first um, phase of that that you mentioned is really around spotting anomalies and like making them known to an organization. Is that part of the rationale behind the name Anomalo or where did Anomalo come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it definitely is. Um, naming things is incredibly hard. Uh, we have a Slack channel, you know, at, at Anomalo that goes back to the, you know, origins of just Elliot and I working on it. That is, you know, company names that is kind of funny to reflect on and look back through the 150 different names that we considered and bounced back and forth. Um, we wanted a name in the end that was friendly and approachable. That's a reflection of our brand. It's not, you know, we want our product to be, to be fun to use, to be, and not, not fun in like the lightweight fun, but I would say the moment that I, that I cherish the most is when I see a new organization, a new user at an organization fall in love with our product. Um, and you know, it gives them some power and some control that they didn't have before, and they and they love what is capable in the product. And so that kind of connection I wanted to I wanted to create. And I and so the name Anomalo felt light and like something you could fall in love with. Um, obviously, it is a play on anomaly. Um, it turns out that it's also a Spanish word, um, and so we didn't we didn't know that at the time. Um, but it's it's fine. It means it means something very similar. Um, and then the other piece, this this might be amusing, might not. Is it's early in the alphabet, uh, and that was important to me. We'd seen many many uh, slides with lots of partners and uh, data ecosystem players ordered alphabetically, mm -hmm. and we thought, why not choose a name with uh, uh, you know letters early in the alphabet? That's that's a clever advantage. Um, 
And time shifting gears a little bit, I know that you just published an early release of chapter one from your soon to launch book all about this problem space, automating data quality monitoring at scale. Uh, can you tell us more about the impetus for creating this book and what you hope readers will take away from it? Yeah, when we started Anomalo, we spent the first probably year and a half pretty heads down building, working with design partners. And then as we began to launch the product, I started spending more and more time writing posts about what we built, about the technology, the philosophy, the approach, and really leveraging what I had done at Instacart and at Sailthrough as a data science leader, where I was leading an organization to build a brand around data and then the use of data and create some you know, very popular blog posts that could help us attract talent. It's kind of in, in the same vein, writing around what we were doing at Anomalo. But those blog posts were always very topically focused and narrow. And as we reached our four year anniversary, realized we had spent so much time with so many organizations around all of the technology components, but also all of the people and organizational and change management dynamics of how you are going to achieve high quality data at scale in this new environment with you know, so much more data and so many more constituents than had ever been there before. And writing an, an O'Reilly book was an opportunity to take that technological story and you know, tell it end to end and really summarize everything that we had learned to help organizations go through this same kind of transformation process that you know, some of our earliest customers are doing. And you know, with so much experience and expertise related to technology and people and change management, management dynamics, what's your best advice for entrepreneurs who are starting out and want to create a, a smart data first organization? So I think that the, the two most important things, the first one is who you hire and you know, hiring people who can demonstrate a, a, um, you know, a passion for, or at least at the very least a deep respect for the use of data to make decisions or the use of data to improve products. And looking for that as a value and a skill that you try to select for across the organization. You know, just about every role can, can benefit from that in, these, in this kind of new modern environment. So I think that's the first piece is to try to stack the deck organizationally as you build the team with folks that really care about this and can execute on it. I think the second piece is around ownership. And where I see most early stage companies go off the rails in terms of their use of data is if they compartmentalize ownership into a small team. And this can happen at enterprises as well. Um, and so if an engineer doesn't feel like they have ownership over the data that their application is emitting. And you know, that, that that's someone else's problem to do that instrumentation or someone else's problem to deal with the analytical limitations of that. It's incredibly difficult to build a data-driven product and organization. You need that engineer to feel ownership of the data. And it goes the other direction as well. If you go up into the consumers, if the person you know, making uh, product decisions interpreting A-B tests doesn't feel like they can have the ownership to also make the strategic decisions around what data should be collected up front and how, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be in, in trouble. And so my, my favorite organizational model is to, when you have data professionals, machine learning uh, professionals, data engineers, is to have them tightly integrated cross-functionally. You know, reporting into ideally the same you know, leader that's responsible for a component of the product or a part of the platform. Um, such that you know, data is a shared responsibility uh, for that part of your platform or function, rather than something that you are outsourcing to a dedicated team. Yeah, thank you for those very actionable takeaways. How are you thinking about growing your own data organization or you know, your organization more broadly in terms of any key hires and product developments uh, that you're building towards that you can share with us? Yeah, we have a few things that are exciting. One, you know, in the beginning, Anomalo, we were very focused on data quality 
and data quality in the context of I'm a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, an analyst, um, or a product you know, owner trying to make decisions with the contents of the data. We've been working more and more towards ensuring we can also meet all of the needs of the data engineer who cares about the flow of data through all of the systems. And so we've got really exciting announcements coming up around new product enhancements there. And then the single role that I'm most interested to hire right now is actually for our data platform team, which is an exciting team because they own the integration layer between all of the business logic and machine learning that we do at Anomalo and the data warehouses that our customers depend upon. And you know, that, that's a very challenging problem. We have uh, you know, 15 different data warehouses or data platforms that we integrate with, and they all have different expectations catalogs, constraints. And we have you know, thousands of different types of functionality that we support in the platform that all need to be able to execute on all of those. And, and so that intermediate layer is, is, is incredibly critical. And there's a lot of exciting innovation that we're driving in that layer to continue to add more and more capabilities to the Anomalo platform. That sounds like a really big complex, exciting problem for the right data leader. Right. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing more too about what you're developing around the flow of, of data and solving for that part of the cycle. Um, well, it's been so exciting talking to you. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Yeah, you're welcome, Lauren. This was a pleasure. Thank you.